Welcome to a Bible study on 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, up to about verse 11, I think. Uh, I'm Angus Kelly, the minister at the Tableview Methodist Church. You can't see me today because I'm hiding behind my camera, but it really is quite hard to do all the video recording, so today you can just imagine uh, what I look like. So we're reading 1 Timothy, which is a helpful uh, book for us to read, a letter for us to read, that... Uh, I saw a nice description when a church goes astray and how to get it back on track. And it really is just a call to the to the basics of the faith and the practice of Christianity. First Timothy is uh, written by Paul, although some people argue that it probably wasn't. That's only since about the 20th century that academics have argued because of the way the language is used and some of the doctrinal issues of First Timothy that, that this is not uh, an original Pauline letter. I tend to go with the idea that it is a Pauline letter, but the difference in language and difference in theology um, comes from the fact that it's a personal letter. And so Timothy would have understood more of the context and be able to read in uh, more than than the usual public letters that Paul wrote. Although this letter wasn't written just for Timothy's consumption, that's why it was copied and shared, but it was also something that would help to identify uh, Timothy as somebody authorized by Paul. So the life of Paul is uh, very well recorded in the scriptures. talks about his conversion, his missionary journeys, one, two, and third missionary journey, and then his arrest in Jerusalem, sent to Rome for trial, uh, possibly released in Rome, and that's not recorded here, another short journey, and then uh, persecuted, imprisoned, and martyred under Nero. Paul meets Timothy on his second missionary journey, uh, perhaps. I'd met him previously on his first missionary journey because uh, he was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer and his father was a Greek and he had been raised there, so probably a a sort of first-generation child of the church. Uh, Timothy's a a helpful person on on this mission because he is uh, the son of a Jewish woman and the son of a Greek man and is able to uh, cross the, the the divide between the different cultures and languages of the people at the time and understand Jewish philosophy and Greek philosophy and bring them together in terms of Christian theology. And so the second missionary journey, Paul is bringing news from the church in Jerusalem about how the the, the Gentiles who have become Christian do not need to observe Jewish law. Even though they are on that same mission, Timothy is circumcised before he goes along the way, probably um, to be all things to all people, to help those who who might say, well, you just don't want to go through with this, to say, to be not to be able to say that, but to say that uh, Timothy, like Paul, observes the laws and keeps them, but realizes and knows and preaches that they are not necessary. And so they go and carry the the message from the Acts uh, 15, the letter that the uh, that James and Peter had written for the people uh, that Paul had ministered to do in the Gentile areas. So Paul picks up Timothy with him and carries on with him through the rest of his missionary journey, that second missionary journey, returning to Jerusalem. And you can only imagine how much Timothy would have learnt as he went along the way. And we can read a lot about Timothy in Paul's letters, a leader of the church in Ephesus, but uh, also often mentioned as one of Paul's inner circle. So on Paul's third missionary journey, he leaves Timothy behind and uh, when he is chased out. And the story of him being chased out, I'll get into later, after being chased out, returning to Jerusalem, arrested, headed to Rome, and from Rome, or after his arrest in Rome, after he's released, writing First and Second Timothy and the letter to Titus. So these three letters are referred to as the pastoral epistles, uh, written to pastors, letters to pastors, Timothy and Titus, probably at that time. So they are different in character to the other letters of Paul, and uh, more personal, more familiar, and that, I think, accounts for some of the differences between the letters like Romans, etc. So Ephesus is there in uh, modern-day Turkey. 
in those days referred to as Asia Minor. And uh, you can see it's just across the bay, the GNC, from Greece. And uh, that's the location. It was an established city, the capital of, of, um, of Asia Minor at the time. And here's just a little video from on top of the mountain next to where ancient Ephesus was. And where you can see that body of water there, that would have been sea in those days. But now it's been silted up over 2,000 years. And the sea has receded about two kilometers back from that area. So erosion over, over those thousands of years has caused the sea to recede or the land to gain. So you could look out from this mountain and see the city of Ephesus below you the marketplace and the harbour and uh, paved walkways and colonnades and uh, that would be a big marketplace that's the pillars around it the walkway uh, various storerooms or perhaps even the lecture rooms where Paul would have lectured and in that um, amphitheatre a place where Paul might have actually had to fight off wild beasts so in Acts chapter 19 we read about how Paul uh, taught in Ephesus for about two years and uh, that he was very well beloved in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, we read about um, how the silversmiths in Ephesian, in Ephesus, uh, sort of riot and protest against Paul because the main faith group in Ephesus was the worship of Artemis of the Ephesians and a huge source of income for the people of Ephesus, was a manufacturer of silver icons of Artemis that w uh, would have been worshipped. Artemis was um, sort of the twin of Diana of Rome, sort of the same same goddess, a goddess of, of women, of fertility, and also uh, a little bit on the hunting side. The protest against Paul in Ephesus might have resulted in him being taken to this this amphitheatre where he records in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32 that he fought with wild animals at Ephesus and that he wouldn't have done that if he didn't believe in the resurrection and the power of God. So he risked his life there. After that uh, run-in with the silversmiths in Ephesus, Paul moved on to to Macedonia, etc., and left Timothy behind to carry on the teaching. And so begins the letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, as Paul addresses Timothy. Now this address is, is obviously a familiar address from one person to the other, but a reminder of who Paul is to remind us who Timothy is, because this letter will be held by Timothy as proof of, of his authority. And so Paul writes, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. And so apostleship is this uh, designation of someone who's been chosen by God for a particular task and to carry out that task. And Paul refers to himself as an apostle to remind those under Timothy's leadership of his authority. Now, we're not very good at authority these days. We sort of bulk at it a little bit. We don't like it. We we prefer to question everything. But the problem is we actually just question those things that don't suit us and we um, we question those things that, that don't suit us and we um, and we accept those things that do. So Paul's stamp of authority means that Timothy is authorized to teach and preach and he is a qualified purveyor of the gospel, so to speak. Um, Paul also reminds us that he's there by God's command, by Jesus' command, to preach this message. And he instructs Timothy, I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. But the aim of in such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And I just, I think this is such an important few verses uh, 
verse 3 about the different doctrines and and the uh, occupying themselves with myths and endless genealogies but that verse 5 the aim of the instruction in the gospel the aim of everything that we do as church the reason we meet for worship the reason we study the scriptures the reason we pray is to produce love that comes from a pure heart a good conscience and sincere faith uh, I think that's just an important reminder of our purpose as church, of my purpose as a minister, to to promote this love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith, and for each of us as Christians to ask ourselves, do we have that love from a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith? So Paul is telling, his, telling Timothy to instruct people not to teach any different doctrine. And uh, the beginning of first of Timothy starts with that instruction about, and so First Timothy begins and ends with instructions about this false teaching, and so it's helpful to look at uh, chapter six, the end of First Timothy, and chapter one, the beginning. Instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine, and this idea that if you don't uh, teach the correct doctrine, there's this uh, tendency to to not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that is in accordance with godliness uh, and talking about being conceited. You know, if we're all about wisdom but not about love, we just might start to think that we're clever. Understanding nothing, the mystery of the gospel is so simple that we fail to understand it because of its simplicity and then we just get interested in controversy and disputes about words. And sometimes we can be motivated by our, our desire to win an argument to to convince others that we're right and, and they're wrong and we end up forgetting the message of the gospel. From these come envy, dissension, slander, base suspicions and wrangling among those who are depraved in mind and bereft of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. And that's how it often happens among Christians is that some people think they are more spiritual than others, that their experience of the faith is greater than others and most of us feel a little bit uh, under like underachievers in the spiritual war, in our spiritual walk or our spiritual life, that those who are arrogant and conceited and, and pretend to be wise uh, humiliate us and we end up thinking that we know nothing and they know everything. Humble yourselves. Uh, cling on to this simple instruction, this message of love from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. In chapter 6, Paul goes on in verse 6 to say that there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, uh, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But he criticizes those who think of, of godliness as a means of gain. And there would have been teachers, I think, in, in Ephesus who were um, demanding pay for their wisdom, uh, demanding um, that they that they get more reward than is due to them and uh, making themselves rich and perhaps even preaching as we do these days a prosperity gospel so that uh, the gospel and our love for Christ comes from desiring to be rich rather than simply loving God with all our hearts. And so we only hurt ourselves when we do that. Back to First Timothy chapter 1, some uh, understanding of the nature of the kind of thing that, that Timothy was up against um, was these people that he had to instruct not to occupy themselves with myths, endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than simple divine training that is known by faith. So Gnosticism officially only came a bit later than, than this time. But I think the myths and Gnosticism can be brought together to a bit of an understanding of, of what was going on in Ephesus and an understanding of the sort of Greek philosophy of religion of the time. So Artemis was understood in a kind of mythical uh, story of uh, it being the child of Zeus and Leto, the twin sister of Apollo, and in love with Orion, the one of Orion's belt. Now these myths of Greek origins and Roman origins were carried back into the past even before the time of the Old Testament, etc. So these are thousands of years old myths. So the, the temple of Artemis of the Ephesians is from about 300 BC. That, the one that stood there at the time 
of Timothy, but an, a temple to Artemis had stood there for, for thousands of years, or hundreds of years, before the time of Paul and Timothy, so before 60-odd A.D. So this, these myths about Roman religion were grounded differently to the grounding of monotheist, the monotheistic religion of the Hebrews, which was only a few thousand years old compared to the myths and understanding of religion around the ancient Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. Now, the interest for the Romans and the Greeks in monotheistic religion was that it was actually a novel and modern idea, but it also drew on historical writings. So we speak about the divine revelation recorded in Holy Scripture. It's not about the Scriptures, but about the history that is recorded and how God's identity and personality is unfolded um, slowly and and systematically through the ages, through the things that the Hebrew people record about what God does. Now, Gnosticism would introduce a kind of dualism, which understood that spiritual reality and physical reality were, were, were n- not able to be joined. That, that um, Jesus, if he had, he had walked on earth, wouldn't have left footprints, wouldn't have left a shadow, would have been a spirit because it was impossible to be holy and material at the same time. This was a sort of later development of Gnosticism, but we can understand how this kind of Gnosticism could uh, develop out of a dualism that kind of understood that, that spiritual realities couldn't occupy physical space as such. And so the ancient gods and goddesses of Rome and Greece were understood to be so ancient that there was a kind of mythical quality to their history. Um, and uh, it's quite complicated, I suppose, to work out where the line between myth and history is crossed. But the problem that, that arises out of this um, mythology is this kind of anything goes. We can take these these stories and allow them to make sense for us of, of anything without having some sort of material, significant uh, lines to draw on. So in in opposition to that kind of dualism, we read in 1 John chapter 1, this beautiful letter and the beginning, we declare to you what was from the ge- beginning as they speak about Jesus. And they, they want the people to know that they're not talking about some sort of myth that you can't hold, see or touch, but we speak to you about what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So then they, they really are emphasizing the idea that they're not talking about a myth, but they're talking about something that they have seen and heard and touched, an emphasis on, on, um, on kind of historical, physical, experiential reality, rather than um, what the early Christians would regard as the myths of the pantheon of Greek and Roman religion or of uh, the worship of Artemis in Ephesus. Besides that, there was this argument about endless genealogies, kind of trying to trace people back to, to which tribe they are or which person they're related to in the Old Testament, uh, legitimizing the inclusion of an individual into a group or the succession of an individual into a role. And so some people in Ephesus would have argued that they were better Christians because they were better Jews, they belonged to the family of of Judaism, of Abraham, more really than the spiritual belongers uh, who had been Gentiles, who had been converted. And so there's a lot of, of speculation about who is most important. But uh, Paul wants to remind the believers that everybody belongs to the household, of economos, the family of God. The main emphasis, though, is still from First Timothy 1, verse 5, love that comes from a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith. That's the aim of all our instruction, our our training as Christians to become people who love with pure hearts, good conscience and sincere faith. And from that love that comes from a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith comes 
action to match. And so Paul continues to talk about the, the role of the law, and part of this is also uh, arguing about the kind of Gnosticism mythology and, and things, is that in, as Christianity was just too simple for most people who are used to complicated religion, and so um, keeping the laws became regarded as something that you could do in order to gain favor with God and become uh, better or gain levels in in terms of your holiness. Um, And so Paul wants to remind us, as he's done in Romans before, the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means that understanding that the law is laid down for the innocent, not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient. Um, so people might have understood that keeping the law was a way to please God, and the realization was that the law was there to keep you from hurting yourself uh, rather than forcing you or finding some way to please God. So the law is not some sort of means of religion, but a uh, just a, a, a helper for us to live our lives. The true religion is love of God and faith that helps us understand the nature of God the thing that God does in our hearts. The law keeps us on the right track. It is not our religion. It is just a guide. Paul goes on to talk about the kind of, uh, the kind of things that are forbidden by the law. And so he makes this list, which is often the kind of list that we, that we use as a, a kind of list of, of terrible things that people do. And I think it's important to talk a bit about that. So the law is for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted me to me. So that sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel is the teaching or instruction that that leads to love, that comes from a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. So Paul is, is, is talking about a kind of contrast between law that sometimes people think that they must keep in order to please God and law that is really understood legitimately as something that helps us not to mess up ourselves and our own lives. But one interesting word that, that I see interpreted and translated differently is the word uh, sodomites in in First Timothy, and sometimes this is used as a a kind of excuse to to hate homosexuals. And so, if you read the NIV version of the Bible, you would see in verse ten it would say fornicators, homosexuals, slave traders, liars, and perjurers, etc. And it's important for us to understand the the difference in Greek language here. The word behind sodomites there would be arsenokoitai. Uh, there were two words used for the homo, not the homosexual act, but for um, for an abusive sexual act, which were arsenokoitai and malakoi. Today we understand, however, that gender identity and gender affection is not just about sex. In the past, we understood same-sex orientation or transgender to be something defective. We are now able to understand that the biology and psychology is much more complicated than we knew in the past. And so the word arsenokoitai that Paul uses in 1 Timothy chapter 1 is talking about an abusive sexual act, and the NRSV Bible, I think, does a good job of interpreting it by using the word sodomites, which um, invokes the attempted rape and shaming of angels in Sodom and also the terrible things that the people there did. And we know that the sin of Sodom was that they had wealth and ease and they let the poor suffer. But I think that the NRV wrongly translates arsenokoitai as homosexuals uh, because in Greek language it was not understood as a as a sexual orientation or a something so close to your being, but rather as an abusive sex act. So today we use the word homosexual to describe a sexual orientation, and that is way more complicated than, than the simple use of, of 
homosexual as a translation for us in Akoitai uh, in the Greek, which um, which just simplifies and and um, kind of uh, it's, a, it's it's an ugly translation, especially for those who are homosexual and who struggle um, with being accepted and loved in church and in community and in the world. The thing that we need to remember, though, is that we focus not on on those matters that are um, things that we judge other people for, but we actually focus on those issues that we struggle with personally. So we can go through this list and say, well, I've never killed my father or mother, but we could think about how we neglect the elderly, and perhaps in that way we might be murderers of our parents. We don't think we're murderers, but we remember what Jesus said about murdering. If you call someone a fool, you have murdered them already. Now, how do we partake in character assassination to our racism and our prejudice and all those things? Are we not murderers, fornicators, sodomites, and slave traders? We might say, well, we've never sold a person, but how are people enslaved to us because maybe we pay them such low wages that that they're enslaved by debt and have no choice, no freedom? Are we liars? No, it's costly to tell the truth. Are we perjurers? Have we, have we lied for others or to gain? All those things in our lives that are contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God and all of those things that, that are not compatible with a life of love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. We are meant to focus on ourselves, as Jesus teaches us, not to look at the, the speck in our brother's eye while we have logs in our own. And that's why I think we sometimes end up focusing on the things that we don't struggle with. And uh, we like to pass that on and develop prejudices for people that, uh, that we don't know and we don't understand. So that's why a little bit of a focus on the various translations of the word arsenikoitai in in the New Testament in terms of understanding how we treat people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex. And as much as we want to think that everybody's one or the other, people are born differently every day and we need to learn to love as God has loved and as God has taught us to love others. But most importantly, to think about what it means to be conformed to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. And as we look at this uh, amphitheater in Corinth, in (laughs) Ephesus, we're reminded how Paul would offer his own life to teach people about God's love. As we think about what it means to live or not live lives that conform to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Paul carries on from verse 7 to talk about his own appreciation for the grace and mercy that God has shown him. And so I invite you to carry on reading that and later in the week I'll continue to post from sorry from verse 12 on Paul's uh, thankfulness and his gratitude for what God has done. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for Paul and for Timothy, who boldly spread the message of your love. And we thank you for the profound truth of the fact that such instruction has the goal of love that comes from a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith. We ask that through your Holy Spirit and through the blood of Christ you'd give us pure hearts, good conscience and that you would work in our hearts and minds to give us sincere faith that would produce love, pure, unadulterated love for our neighbors, for our families, our enemies, for those we meet along the way, that we would live lives that conform to the gospel of a blessed God, a God who loves us and cares for us immensely. So, Lord, as you've entrusted this gospel to Paul, to Timothy, you entrust it to us, and we ask that you'd help us to preach it in the way that we live and have our being. 
Amen.